Welcome back to Tipton Bros. Today, we'll be examining a perspective, first presented by distinguished historian of the Crusades, Jonathan Riley Smith, in his article titled, Crusading as an Act of Love. I found the thesis intriguing and wanted to boil it down for a broader audience. Let's get into it. Crusading as an act of love asserts that, simply put, love was a driving factor in the crusading movement. Other secular motivators existed, such as politics, reputation, or wealth, but it is love where Riley Smith plants his flag. More specifically, he states, I hope to show that the idea of the crusader, expressing love through his participation in the acts of armed force, was an element in the thinking of senior churchmen in the central Middle Ages. Author Riley Smith contends that a love of God was manifested through the physical act of crusade, a sentiment peddled by church leadership that taking up arms with fellow Christians was the strongest demonstration of one's faith, a true love of Christ. He does qualify his claim, remarking that, My discussion is limited to the justification of the Crusades to the East. Also note, Riley Smith speaks about the Crusades generally, with evidence spanning between 1095 and 1256. One of the strongest facets of the paper in favor of his argument is a recorded sermon given by Cardinal Otto of Châteauroux in 1245, a boisterous homily intended to rally support for a new crusade originating in France. According to the text, the speech went as follows. It is a clear sign that a man burns with the love of God and zeal of God when he leaves country, possessions, house, children, and wife, going overseas in the service of Jesus Christ, whosoever wishes to take and have Christ ought to follow him, to follow him to death. Obviously, the cardinal does not mince words. The ultimate love of God can be proven by abandoning belongings, nation, and family to embark on a campaign to a foreign land. Moreover, if a Christian truly wished to take and have the Son of God, giving one's life in combat would warrant such a reward. Cardinal Otto of Châteauroux, a senior churchman, truly believed that the finest way to express a devotion to God was through a participation of armed force. Riley Smith quips, From the first, referring to the First Crusade, they were treated as soldiers of Christ, who had joined an expedition out of love for him, and the taking of the cross, the sewing of a cross on a man's garments, as a symbol of his vow to crusade, was seen as a response to Christ's statement, Whosoever doth not carry his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Through this sermon and twisting of scripture, it becomes clear that love was certainly a consideration within senior church leadership and an impetus for those reclaiming the Holy Land. To the same end, the author calls upon the words of Pope Innocent II, former head of the Catholic Church. Addressed to the Templars, the Pope reinforced the concept of love by way of crusade. He comments that, As true Israelites and most instructed fighters in divine battle, filled with the flames of divine charity, you carry out in deeds the words of the gospel. Greater love than this no man hath, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Pope Innocent II emphasizes the divine nature of their actions, of battle, and the taking up of arms in the name of Christ. Referring to the men as true Israelites, who by their commitment to fight are fulfilling the gospel of John. Manipulation of scripture was at the core of crusading as an act of love, and necessary to garner adequate backing. An account from the Council of Clermont in 1095 highlights this tendency. Pope Urban II, on the brink of the First Crusade, invoked the New Testament to all in attendance, voicing, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And everyone that hath left house or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall possess life everlasting. This message resonated throughout Western Christendom, planting a firm desire for armed pilgrimage. Crusading promised salvation through combat, a righteous endeavor that made a devout love for Christ tangible for all to witness, or at least in theory. It is known that violence is generally frowned upon in Christianity, but loopholes and exceptions can always be fabricated. Riley Smith observes that the striking thing about these references to love is that they are one-dimensional, and therefore not truly Christian. 
Love of neighbor was always treated in crusade propaganda in terms of fraternal love for fellow Christians, never in terms of love shown for enemies, and this one-sided view of love did not properly reflect Christian teaching in the past or at the time. So, how was this aggression defended? Through the texts of St. Augustine. According to Riley Smith, Augustine devoted most of his writing on violence to justifying the suppression of heresy, and made little distinction between force associated with war against external foes, i.e. Muslims, and force used internally to repress heretics. He continues proclaiming, to Augustine, the intentions of those who authorized violence and of those who participated in it had to be in favor of justice, a virtue which for him assigned to everyone his due, working through love of God and love of one's neighbor. Baldric of Dahl, an abbot and later archbishop, recorded equivalent rhetoric from Pope Urban II in the previously mentioned Sermon at Clermont in 1095, which roused the First Crusade. It is dreadful, brothers, dreadful, for you to raise thieving hands against Christians. It is much less evil to brandish the sword against the Muslims. In a particular case, it is good, because it is charity to lay down lives for friends. An intentional grace base left by St. Augustine allowed for papal interpretation, which was used to legitimize the Crusades as an act of love. As an aside, although exploitation of doctrine and scripture by the papacy is not a central part of Riley Smith's argument, and merely a caveat, I find it fascinating. As the popes utilize scripture to rally Christians into eventual violence, bending passages like Matthew 10.37 and Luke 14.25 to fit a narrative, one could just as easily quote Matthew 26.52 or Hebrews 12.14, among others, to dissuade such language. I hope you've enjoyed today's brief overview of Jonathan Riley Smith's Crusading as an Act of Love. A like is greatly appreciated, and recommendations are always welcome. The document will be linked in the description for those of you that are interested. Until next time, on Tipton Bros.